Hello. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Good evening. All right, we have a, a fairly lengthy agenda, but um, I think we can get through it without any pain. Uh, first and foremost, you're on camera. Uh, so you're on camera. So uh, know that you are, you are, not only are you representatives of our community, just like you always are as a board member, you are officially representing the community uh, visually. So, uh, you know, take that for what it may, be yourself, but be your best self. Um, uh, I normally do not like to introduce motions during my chair uh, report because I like the committee process that we have and I think it's incredibly important to have that debate and those conversations. But sometimes time does not allow for us um, to publicly post agenda items or things happen in our district that make us um, need to react, I think, in a, in a, in a faster, in a quicker timeline. Um, so I'm actually going to be introducing two today. Um, one of which uh, actually did go to the committee, but it wasn't voted on. And actually, due to feedback that we got at the committee level and questions, the actual bill in question was changed and altered and made a little bit stronger. So the first item that I'd like to introduce um, that I will actually talk about and then I will actually introduce as a motion for what we want to do, and then I will need that to come from the floor just to let you know procedurally how this will happen, um, is the Superfund Enhancement Act being introduced by Nidia Velasquez. So, um, the, Super, the Superfund Enhancement Act is basically um, a bill to bring back to life the Superfund tax, which will, let me tell you what it will do, it will create tax deductions for small businesses, homeowners and renters forced to relocate from in or near a Superfund site, the maximum tax deduction will be $10,000. The key part that I stressed there was homeowners and renters. That was not in the bill when it came to our committee. Um, that has since, uh, I think, the 10 days since our committee been rewritten into the bill. So that's exciting. Good work, committee. Um, so that is a new addition. Uh, part two is a disaster loan pilot program administered by the Small Business Administration annually appropriating $10 million for fiscal years 2019 through 2023, providing direct loans to eligible small businesses, homeowners, and renters, again added, that have been forced to relocate from a Superfund site. And part three, economic injury loan program for small businesses forced to relocate from a Superfund site. Uh, the Congresswoman had asked our committee and several other, um, I think, community entities to support the bill before it was introduced at, the, uh, at Congress. And so, um, she was very much wanting our, us to support, and it will be supported before our next full board meeting. Thus, it will, not have a, it will not have the opportunity to go through another committee hearing, which is why that I am just introducing the concept today. And what I would appreciate is if they got a motion of support to send uh, support from Community Board 6 for the Superfund Enhancement Act. Is there a second? Is there any discussion that we, you would like to have on this, um, on this motion, on, on the motion? Hearing none, I will call the question. All in favor of uh, Community Board 6 supporting Superfund Enhancement Act, um, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, on a less, I think, positive note, but potentially super positive because what may come from it, I think all of us are aware of the horrific accident that happened at Fifth Avenue and Ninth Street earlier this month. Um, and uh, I would just like to introduce a resolution that we would send to the Department of Transportation and the Mayor's Office together that resolved the community, uh, community, Brooklyn Community Board 6 request that the NYC DOT act without delay to analyze and implement safety improvements to the Ninth Street Corridor with special regard to increasing the safety of the streets, most vulnerable users. Um, I need a motion from the floor for a second. A second? A second. Is there any discussion on this? Yes, Leroy. Can I ask the parliamentarian, do I have to abstain? You can ask. I, can I just not say anything? Because there will be a unanimous vote without the abstention? You can walk out of the room. I know, but I don't want you to say anything. Because if you abstain for cause, wait. If you abstain for cause, you don't count. So you can say. I just don't want to stay anywhere on the motion. That's the yeah, yeah. Leave the room. Go leave. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us don't realize that a lot of the <coughs> plantation trials.
departments that go through our district um, are actually not BK sixes, uh, our own sanitation trucks. Uh, they come from mid Brooklyn. They're usually eight, sometimes nine, sometimes district two. They come through Eastern Parkway, Grand Army Plaza, Prospect Park West, and then go down 9th Street uh, to the Hamilton Avenue uh, transfer station, come back up the same way and go to 8th Avenue. So uh, besides looking at truck traffic, uh, specifically looking at uh, the, they should be using uh, uh, truck routes. So I don't know how you want to name, put that into motion but I'd like uh, DOT to specifically target uh, sanitation trucks as well as regular trucks uh, using it uh, illegally in, on any part of that route. Does anybody want to create the language or do you want to put forth language that I would ask Eric as the mover on the floor to accept as a friendly amendment? Part of the review, we asked DOT <laughs> to specifically look at uh, the use of trucks uh, using uh, uh, trucks using 9th Street as well as other uh, non truck route streets in our district. Uh, city, city vehicles, city trucks. Well, no, that's what I'm saying, anybody. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, how it's about also the, uh, the, where the. How about this? That I offer up DOT to specifically look at, at truck use of surface streets that are not truck routes, that are not designated truck routes. Yeah, but if we leave out the city trucks, they don't really ticket it, and they they just leave so it. So we should say including city trucks. Yes, they, if it's not specifically named, they won't do anything to the city trucks. Eric, we go through that, that with borough board meetings, and the uh, borough heads talk to the districts that last for two weeks, and then they're back on. Okay. No, I think that's great. Thank you for the, so I don't need to do anything with an accepted friendly amendment, correct? Three. Correct. All right. Um, so are there any comments or questions on the amendment? Yeah. In the lane of trucks. This here, what happened there was due to somebody recklessly driving through there that did this. <coughs> Why bring trucks into it? I mean, garbage trucks have got to pick up garbage. Trucks got to make deliveries. I mean, you're narrowing the scope here by saying trucks. What we need is better cooperation on these cars in the street. Some of them think they're evil can evil on these streets and don't even look at the, the fact that people are crossing the street that they're doing more than 25 miles an hour. I'm against that, that motion that, it, that was made. Okay. Is I think anybody riding rec recklessly should be, should be dealt with. So that means we need more enforcement on those big avenues, especially 9th Street. Anybody? going down a tangential road here that I don't know that we need to. So let me again repeat the motion that was initially proposed without the friendly amendment that was accepted. That Brooklyn Community Board SIC requests that the New York City Department of Transportation act without delay 
to analyze and implement safety improvements to the Ninth Street Corridor with special regard to increasing the safety of the streets most vulnerable users. It's fairly general, does not get into trucks, does not get into any of such details that I think, which we should do, and if you guys want to do, I would ask you guys to take it up with the Transportation Committee to go through a laundry list of every one of the issues that you want to do. We're just saying, DOT, we're paying attention to what happened earlier this month. We want you to pay attention to what happened earlier this month, and we want you to do something about it immediately, which, by the way, I'm sure they're already doing, but it doesn't hurt for us as the community voice to say that. So I would actually like to go back and ask Eric to unaccept the friendly amendment, which I think refines the, it too far, and we're just asking DOT to look into this issue right now because it's important. So unaccepted. Unaccept, thus unaccepted. Yes, I absolutely think we should, and I think that gets a joint point. Yes, fine. Yeah, uh, I understand what you're saying. Some of the comments about truck traffic and locals, it's allowable to use any street for local delivery, so that wouldn't be stopping that. The problem with the sanitation trucks has been going on for years. <coughs> Nobody's been able to stop it. During that time, I, I spoke to 78th Precinct, who had about eight people on that corner, and explaining it to them and gave them that. They say, well, we don't take that. And they watch a garbage truck come down Prospect Park West and go straight through. Nobody is stopping it. If we don't say anything specifically, at least about the sanitation trucks, it will continue on infinitum unless it's addressed. That's my feeling. But I want to refer that back to the Transportation Committee to do a universal study of all of it. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. That, that what you're saying about is going to be a larger issue. Uh, Jerry. I'm going to call the question. All right, question has been called. All right, um, all right. so back to the original motion. Without, Brooklyn Community Board 6 requests that DOT act without delay to analyze and implement safety improvements in the Ninth Street Corridor with special regard to increasing the safety in streets of most vulnerable users. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent, thank you so much. Um, all right. Oh. <laughs> Um, last month, I announced the formation of an ad hoc development committee and was super excited to get two emails back from people saying that they wanted to join, but I recruited a third member just before this meeting and spoke with another member who I'm going to recruit to that committee as well, so we have four, which is great. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is one of the things that we're going to start talking about, we're probably going to call a meeting over the next month to just get together. We might even just do it over pizza. Um, but I want to get together. We want to try to implement, and this is Glenn Kelly's idea, of um, to create a peer mentoring program. So uh, uh, a, a member who's been on the board for a while can, talk, can work with a new member so that we can start everybody sort of getting some of this institutional knowledge that oftentimes doesn't get shared um, because we only meet once a month. Um, and I think that can be helpful. So there's not this question of like, can I do this? Sometimes people don't feel comfortable saying that in a meeting or, or at a full board. Uh, ask your peer buddy. Um, so we're going we're gonna to work on that, and we'll let you know who we're assigning everybody to as we move forward. But I just wanted to let you know I hadn't forgot about that. Um, another note that we are going to be changing is you guys may have noticed that you did not get a newsletter or the six. Is yeah. that the sixth sense this month. The reason why is because I am utterly frustrated with that publication that we put out for the longest time because I found it to be a bulletin and not really a newsletter. I didn't think it informed the community of the things the community board did. It talked about snow removal and where you can drop off your batteries, which are very important things, and we will continue to have those things. But what I'm going to be asking over after this meeting and after we have motions that are passed, I'm going to actually going back to chairs and I'm going to ask them to write up a paragraph about the one thing that came in front of their committee this month that, they, that we think is a big deal that we want to inform the community about. So for instance, one of the things I'm going to ask, you're going to find out later today, is that in the uh, Landmarks Committee there was a discussion about a new landmark that was not, the timing was different. And we as a board sent a letter to DOB and to um, the Landmarks Preservation Commission to say, hey, listen, our clock has moved too fast, too far past this, but people want this site to be landmarked, and this is, this is an important site. That's worthy of explanation and showing what we do as a board. Mike had an interesting permits discussion this week that um, we supported, we voted against as a board, but the SLA said, too bad, we're granting the license, right? 
People need to know the work that we do and the fact that sometimes the agencies go against us. And what they should do is if they're upset, they should contact their local state representative who works and, and represent and work with the SLA to say, what's going on? Why isn't the SLA representing our neighborhood? I don't mind if you call the community board, but know that we did our part. We said no to a bad deal, to a bad customer, and we tried our best. We were ignored. So now it's time to step it up and go to somebody else. So that's what we're going to see. You're going to see a slight shift. We hope to try to get that out a week after the, um, the full board, so the timing will change a little bit. Um, but we'll do a regular announcements letting people know about motions and, and when committee hearings are, and please sign up for those. Finally, I would like to just say that we have, I want to thank the, per, the, the, the Finance Personnel and Law Committee. They have engaged in the first interviews for our district manager search, and they have more scheduled, um, which means that we are that much closer to being a fully staffed office. So thank you so much to the members of FPL, and um, there will be more to report back as we get to finalists, and then eventually we'll come to the full board for a vote um, for who we as Community Board 6 will select as our next district manager. With that said, I will move on to... Yeah, the minutes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, we have a quorum, so I would ask for approval of the minutes. So moved. Any co corrections, comments? Yes? Second. Oh, second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Oh, abstention. One abstention for Roger. Great. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to skip the DM's report, and we're going to go directly to the Economics Waterfront Community Development and Housing Committee. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, this is, I'm Ariel Krasnow, I'm the chair of the Housing Committee, which is part of the Economic Waterfront Community Development and Housing Committee. Uh, we um, met on Monday, we had a request from the residents of Gowan, uh, Wyckoff Gardens uh, to meet with us regarding the um, next gen uh, development that is slated for that property. and. We had met with them exactly a year ago with NYCHA, and they had at that time expressed uh, um, some concerns about how the process was moving along and issues that they wanted to some clarity on from NYCHA. Um, and when they came back to us uh, and requested a meeting about a month ago, uh, it was right after the RFP had, the developer from the RFP had been selected, but the residents had not yet been informed of it other than through the, um, the uh, public media. So we met with them and their request to us, which uh, we voted on in, in committee, um, but which I don't believe requires a vote here. We just want to inform the, um, the full board that we will be, um, we, we heard their concerns. Uh, we have the meeting notes, which you can all review in your uh, docket there. And we will, we agreed to write a letter to um, to NYCHA administration and to the New York City Law Department. Uh, and in that letter, we would um, forward to them a letter, a very um, detailed letter, like a nine-page letter that the Residence Committee put together, uh, in which they expressed a request for a number of uh, articles of information that they had not, had not been forthcoming from NYCHA, which they would like to have, as well as um, explanation of how the proceeds from the development would be used. Um, they had uh, concerns about HUD uh, re regulations that, were, that they felt were in violation and environmental reviews that they had not seen and wanted to see. Um, also requests as to if other funding sources had been uh, looked into because for in, as opposed to using the uh, next-gen development as uh, funding part of that is going to preservation of existing buildings. So <clears throat> the, the letter will essentially be forwarding this information, which will include their letter uh, written and signed by the and CC to a number of elected officials, uh, which is dated March 9th. Uh, uh, they circulated a petition regarding their, uh, their how they felt about the development. Uh, that had, an, I didn't count the number of signatures, but I think it was well over 100. Um, the, the notes that we took, the, the concerns that we heard, and, um, and also the, the who was at uh, that meeting. There were about 65 to 70 residents at that meeting. Um, and we have our will request from NYCHA that they respond within a month. I think that's, we, we didn't really 
set the date on that, but we... Basically, is that we'll ask for a response well before it comes back to us for ULERP, because right. this project will be coming to us for ULERP, so we'll need a response from NYCHA before then to make an informed decision. Right. Uh, and, of course, a, and a very large, a big, big issue is, uh, is the transparency and the, um, the, the way in which the residents were included or some felt not included in the visioning in the, in the stakeholders committee. There were a lot of um, constraints and restrictions on that. Uh, I know CB6 had been part of that. I believe there's one coming up. We were not made aware of that. There's one coming up, in the, I think, in the next week or two. So we, we do need more information from NYCHA, and we will be uh, sending this letter out to them shortly. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so that, that was, it was uh, incorrectly listed in the agenda as a motion. It was actually just a report. Um, uh, we just wanted to report this is what we're doing. This letter will be coming out under CB6 letterhead under my signature. Um, asking for all these things and forwarding that note from the residents. The com uh, at our committee at our committee meeting, we had a, f a full quorum, and and the uh, the motion that you see in your notes was um, agreed to was approved unanimously. Yes. This particular um, this is this particular letter is related to an action that NYCHA is taking at Wyckoff Gardens, which is a, a development that will um, be 50% market rate, 50% affordable. Um, in terms of other actions to take across Wyckoff Gardens and Red Hook and Warren Street, um, we we have done uh, you know back in 2012 uh, we did a number of town hall meetings. We did prepare. Uh, uh, responses that we were, <laughs> I, I'm sorry to say we were about to send to NYCHA when Sandy hit and there were other issues that were more pressing than, than the, the list of items that we had in our notes. But, but yes, I think uh, in terms of generally uh, from the community board, we should be, we can be more involved in all of the NYCHA projects. So in terms of forwarding the, the needs. I, I think I'm not sure if other if the other projects are also up slated for next gen. I'm not sure about that. Right now, aren't there only two citywide projects that are slated for next gen? So I think this we were targeting it around specific next gen. Yeah. Again, I, I think it's a really good idea, and I think we can take up a larger issue about our board and our district yeah. about the other issues that are not necessarily related to next gen. And, and again, I, I think your committee not that it doesn't have less. Uh, Few items to deal with, but I think these are important. Yeah. We should we should raise it at that at a at a future meeting. But this one, I'd rather not, I'd rather not confuse it and have this be about next gen. Yes, it is. All of it? Oh well, I think yeah, I, I'm sorry. There's ne next gen is is slated. For, you're, you're correct. The next gen refer the initiative itself is for all the projects. Uh, we were specifically talking about the the um, real estate development uh, on, on, on this, on Wake Up Gardens. I stand corrected. The, the request bang, is... How much bang the city is getting for its... We, the, the ask is in there. The ask is in there to see the proposals and all, of, all the proposals that came in and the proposal that was, uh, was selected and that should include that information. Now, the reason why that Ms. Valerie Bell, she is the president of White Folk Party, but they was doing the detail meetings on, on a regular basis, but they only concern about the development that's going to go up in their backyard. That's what they are concerned about. Because if you look at it, it's a state they have it. Okay, and then, then again too, they did not come to the development, because I live in Warm, I live across the street from them. This is why I'm talking, because I'm across the street. And then I go to their meetings, but they, the whole concern is that they do not want those buildings our built on NYCHA grounds, because for some reason they did not come to the, uh, NYCHA residents, nor did they come across the street to the stores and the people that live around the facility. They did not come and they give, you know, give out this information. Everything was done undercover. And it was not right that, 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 that everybody was left out. Okay, but we understand that this is across the board. We understand that. But the concern right now is in White Park Gardens 
because they want to build right here. Right. Okay, and so this is our focus. We do not want it there. I mean, there were so many people there. We all mentioned it. Okay, so this is why we are saying this. And if you, we ask all could, well, could community board come out and then come to the meeting to hear rather what Miss Charlene Nimmons spoke. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, she's here. There she go. Miss Charlene Nimmons, she's here. And Miss Valerie Bell. Yeah, she's there too. That's the, that's the president. Okay, but thank you. Oh, thank y'all. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm only just rather piggybacking on what we just accomplished, rather them doing this meeting and why, and why we are doing it. Okay, but it is across the board. But, but we need to focus on, on white girl first because everything is right there. And I don't think that they should be doing that. Okay. Uh, again, we will have an opportunity to comment on this officially when they come before us for ULIP, which will be a land use action that our board has to take action on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Leroy. I'm curious why we wouldn't vote on this letter as a board. And, you know, we can. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally fine if you want to. I mean, we're doing the letter. I'm, I'm, under, the, I'm under the impression, and I, and I know this board. I don't think we're not going to vote in favor. Oh, no, no, I don't think it was that question. It gives it, it, gives it uh, leverage if the board says, this is what we voted on it, and this is what. So, so the, the, there are two letters. There's the letter that um, was drafted by the residents, right. and that letter is, is an attachment to our, our letter is simply saying, you need to look at this and, and respond to that. No, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. with you. I, I think by having the weight of the board's vote on it, I think it gives it something. I, I, yeah, okay. We have, a, mo we have a motion that motion you can, you can all look, so we can, if, if you'd like to vote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want no, to there is a motion. There's a motion. There's, There's a motion with court. Well, I can, I can read the motion. Question has been called. <laughs> uh, all in favor of a motion to send request to uh, New York City Housing Authority for Wyckoff Gardens Residents Association for more information regarding the planning of the next-gen development from Wyckoff Gardens amongst other details that are listed in their formal letter from their residents association. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have land use. <laughs> So first of all, I'm going to apologize if I appear to give you a goofy grin. I had Novocaine in the last 90 minutes or so. So the right side is a little, the right side is not necessarily doing what I ask it to. So the first project we're going to talk about is 280 Richard Street. Some of you will, um, some of you will remember that about a year or so ago, uh, they came to us to talk about the, um, the buildings the buildings themselves, uh, which they plan to build on that pier, and and there we are again. Uh, and we we gave them uh, approval for those buildings with the idea that they would come back to us again to talk about what they were going to do around the perimeter and in the center. And that's why they're coming back to us. So let's just go through um, some of these pictures can skip that one, it's not worthwhile. So there's a, a sort of a site plan. Again, these white areas are the two buildings. Here is the pier that goes around it, and then here is the landscaped area in the center. Um, here uh, in the front, we're talking, you know, basically a park. There's going to be an amphitheater here at the corner. Um, on this side, there's going to be the ability for kayaks uh, and the like to, to uh, enter the water. And the relief they're seeking from us is because of the way the water approaches on the sides, they're not able to do exactly what the zoning requires them to do. So they're not asking us for a major, uh, you know, to give them permission to not do some major thing. It really, you know, it's, it's feet and inches on the sides um, and the way the, the tide comes up um, that they're not able to do uh, what they want. So, you know, again, the, you know, we can skip that one. So there's just an idea of what it would look like at the front. 
There again, the amphitheater, and that's actually the side. I'm sorry, it's kind of the side on, with the corner, and you can see that there are some rock formations. And you know, as the tide changes, the water will come up, and there will not be exactly as much square footage as the zoning uh, requires because of the nature of the site. Um, there's the, again a picture of the amphitheater. Uh, that's the center. Keep going. Um, that's a, sort of a site plan of the front. Um, green space, uh, walkways, and things like that. Um, skip that one. There's the again the front. They plan to have restaurants here and perhaps some out. You know these are just schematics. This is not you know exactly what it's going to look like. There are the two office buildings again, with the front. Um, there's the one of the sides, and again I believe that's where the the kayaks can come down, um, and people can access uh, the water. So we had a number of people from the community, but by and large, I won't say all of them, but many of them were concerned about things that were not necessarily related to how this space is going to be used from a, a park standpoint. Um, there have been some concerns. First of all, I will tell you, since it was raised and questioned, when we passed the original motion, we talked to them about the need for a shuttle bus. And we also talked, they also spoke, and we agreed the idea of they perhaps partnered with IKEA. Um, the BSA resolution that went through requires them to do that. They are still talking to IKEA about the possibility of partnering with them, but as long as they have a shuttle bus, you know, I won't say we don't care, but the idea is that as long as they have a shuttle bus, they say they intend to do that. They're still talking to IKEA about trying to make it, you know, a, a, a partnership since IKEA is, is so close. Most of the community concerns have to do with, A, there are, as part of the excavation to put the metal, metal sheeting, there you go, there's the word, metal sheeting around the outside, um, they left some piles of dirt and those piles of dirt are not covered, this being a waterfront location. When the wind blows, the dirt is blowing out onto the streets. There's a school nearby. Parents are coming to pick up their children. They're getting inundated with, um, you, know, d you know, small pieces of debris. Um, there's also, you know, some concern about whether or not um, there, uh, that whether the piling work has been finished. There was some concern about that. They say the fence that surrounds the area is in disrepair. Um, they also said that there was some creosote lumber, which the developer disputes. They say that is not there. I don't, haven't <laughs> explored the site in depth myself, so I can't answer that. And then there was a concern along Beard Street that since they've done the work that they've done, that there has been some flooding they dispute it, but it's kind of a, you've come in, you've done some work, and a street that didn't flood before floods. It's kind of hard to argue with, it's kind of hard to argue with the logic that perhaps the work you did has, has changed something. And then the other concern was that the maritime uses are not active enough um, to meet the needs of, again, there were one or two people that that felt that that was, you know, that that was a concern. Um, it was not necessarily echoed by the community, but it's important, and they will again have, you know, the ability for people to access, you know, kayaks and things like that to get into the water. So, you know, while that was raised, it didn't get much further than than being raised. And, you know, again, no, uh, not impugning the person that raised it. They were very knowledgeable, and they worked for an organization that was involved in that kind of thing, but again, it didn't get uh, very far. So um, we uh, did a resolution um, that approved what they, the, their, the relief they're seeking um, with a couple of conditions. Um, first of all, they had talked to the community earlier and raised the idea of putting a public bathroom perhaps along here. They're in agreement with that. 
we thought let's put it in the resolution to make sure that it actually happens. So that's condition number one. Um, condition number two is that Thor, the developer, enter an agreement with uh, uh, the state to remediate the debris. Um, that was something we felt needed to happen immediately. Um, and um, we also stated that they, as well as uh, the city, needed to investigate uh, the flooding on um, Beard Street to determine what the cause of it is. And finally, that they need to finish up the work uh, on the piles and, um, you know, make that, make, that, make that right so that whatever impact it's having on the community ceases. So that was uh, approved by a vote of 10 yeas, one nay, and one abstention. Um, after the committee met, I had further discussions with the developer and found out if they are, were willing to agree to and comply with the conditions. Uh, and they have uh, sent a letter to me formally stating that they are committing to doing a public restroom. Um, their environmental council is actively working on a draft consent order with DEC that will address the dust control and management of the stockpiles on the site. Um, those exact means are not done because they're still being evaluated by DEC and their environmental council, but they've engaged. Um, they have committed to use to having their engineers investigate the Beard Street flooding issue uh, to determine if they've had any effect, um, but they have committed to doing that. They have committed to covering the piles and are working again with DEC uh, to discuss what exactly they need to do for alternative dust control measures, but that process has started. Um, and so I just wanted to make you aware of that. And they've also sent a letter to DEC that demonstrates that uh, there is non-hazardous compositions to the fill on site. DEC is examining the, the, that letter from their environmental council. So since the meeting, I just want to say that we followed up and we've gotten all of that. I right apologize. Now. That was another issue that was raised about the composition of the fill. Um, they said that it was investigated and, you know, there we go. It, it, it's mostly along the two sides where there, the water comes up. I mean, not that water doesn't come up here, but it doesn't actively wash up onto the, uh, onto the design. So along the two sides where the water washes up, they are literally off by feet and inches, not by, yard, not by yards. So essentially, they, we are allowing them to build a, a slightly smaller park because of the nature of the site and the nature of with the way of the way it interacts with the water. So that, okay, so that sounds like you're referring to 6260. So uh, there's other, there's two others that refer to vi visual corridors. Uh, I'm uh, that wasn't discussed, and I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. That's because that's a that's a parrot back of the of of what was in of what we were asked. But I apologize. I, I'm not. A, we did not discuss visual corridors, uh, unless somebody else is remembering something. We did not discuss. Jerry, do you recall anything? Um, first, let me just say on the upper part of the picture, that blue area, that's where the kayak ramp would be, and because it goes into the water, it's not considered part of the waterfront access. This is the deck. The same on the lower portion, the first blue area. They're going to have the water wash under the access, and the way it's written, they need relief there. And the second and third are the same thing. They're going to have an outlook there, but where you see the blue area on the lower portion of the screen, uh, you won't be able to walk there. It's going to be rip wrap and the tide will be able to flow in. I understand all that. That all seems to be under 6260, but there's two other parts of the resolution that referenced here that I haven't spoken to. Um, Sorry, I wasn't there, so I don't know. I know, I understand, I understand. And the requirements for, the, for under 6260, it, this is covered because what's happening is where the blue areas are, there's no access for the people to walk. So it's... And see what they might see. Right. And the way the zoning is written for that, it 
you need to get relief. I think David's question is that we, we get fully what 60, how 6260 is being remediated by our, by our motion, but 6250, 62822B, and 62332, which are, and 62513, are all, and, well, sorry, and 62822A, are all part of this motion as well. And I'm just curious to know if anybody at the committee knows what we are, what the comments and questions were from in the presentation about that. The, Mike. Presenta the presentation uh, did not include anything about an impaired visual card from the developer. My understanding is the visual corridor was down the middle, and the question that I had was that the visual corridor, was, the, the, if you look at the section that that down, if that's open through the building, but because of you know uh, it's actually raised about six feet, so the question would be from here to can you actually see out or not? And I believe I'm not. I'm, they were not clear about that in that presentation. Yes. That, and I don't know. What, if the visual corridor is a requirement or not, but then certainly if that was included, then my question is that if that, is, if that raises six feet from here straight up, how do you see out the water through what's called the visual corridor? But, I, you know, I'm not... Uh, all right. That's, I what, I remember. I That's I what I remember. <coughs> the middle and the raised elevation. I, I apologize. I don't recall, so, I don't recall that part of it. Do we want to, yeah. I don't want to take away it. If we want to continue this conversation, I want to... I think it's all about this subject. We're all we're all on this motion. All right. Well, to, to, I just want to point of clarification about the letter that you received as well. It sounds to me like they had basically agreed to our stipulation to the exception of the independent investigation, and they were willing to do their own investigation. Is that a fair summation of? Uh, no. I think what was going on is they can't force DEP to do anything, and our our motion is to get DEP to look into it. But they are actually doing it on their own as well. So they committed to, to look, having their engineer look into the issue. But our, our, our issue is that DEP has to find out what's going on there. I, th I thought we were asking them to have an independent agency evaluate what the... What the well, that's the DEP. Like. They can't force the city to do it. They, they, as a developer, can't force the city to do something. So our we're asking the can. city to do it. Our letter can our ask letter the city to that. do it. Well, and or as addition, much as our letter can do anything. Right, can much as, our, right. as our request can do anything. And they're doing their own. The applicant must conduct an independent investigation into the causes of flooding. That, to me, sounds like the applicant needs to hire an outside engineering firm to look at the causes of flooding. That's what that sounds like to me. And it sounds like what they're saying is we're not going to hire an outside firm. We're going to do it ourselves. And we all know what the result will be when they do it themselves. So that was the point. They have experts that, that are beyond people that are employed, you know, as full-time employees of the developer who have that expertise. So I, I think that's what they're depending on as opposed to, you know, sending the guy that sits in the corner in the developer's office to go over and look at it. If that's, if that's what you're driving at. Uh, not, it's not what I'm driving at. Well, I mean, I, yes, I, I see what you're saying. I, I, think that, I think that can be read another way uh, that says the applicant must conduct an independent investigation, AKA their own, as opposed to an independent investigation where they hire a new person. Right? So I'm saying it, it's a semantic, <laughs> it's, it's a semantic, how one reads it. I, I agree, but I, I think your point is well taken. Karen. Did the committee yeah, sorry. do okay. a, um, a report or um, inquire about a report from 311 about flooding prior to the door coming into the neighborhood? Did the committee do that? Uh, people who live in the area were there and said that there was no flooding there before this work began, so we had to, we depended on their testimony. My question is, did they provide you with a timeline in the letter that they were sent to you? Or sent to you? For what? For any of the uh, remedies. For any of the um, remedies they were talking about. <laughs> Well, they said, the letter said that they, they were formally going to provide a restroom, a public restroom. That's and, what the and Some of the other stuff is happening immediately, like they're covering the piles and things like that, at least that's the way I understand it. So the things that are causing the most immediate quality of life issues are things that they're dealing with immediately. Okay. 
Well, now with, now with this here uh, wall that's going up, have they put in place any incentive? Brother, just in case if there's another Sandy, brother, you know, like another storm like Sandy? Because I'm saying the, the people that's going to be living in this, in this area going to be an office. It, 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 not it's going to be really, really, really This is commercial sad. property. This is commercial property. So I'm hoping property. that they're going to put something in place for that. Well, the construction will meet all of the current codes. I mean, you know, so for for property located in that kind of in that kind of location. Yeah, because they already they already said that they get in flooding. This is what I'm asking. Are they going to put something in place for that? Just in case if there will be another that was not the subject of, of this particular item it had to do with the area surrounding it the pier so that was not a question that was asked at this meeting uh, I'm really concerned that this is not meeting the uh, national flood insurance program's requirement for new construction to be 14 feet above mean high water Again, that was all discussed more than a year ago when we approved their original thing. No, this, we didn't discuss well, it then, and we should discuss it. Again, it's, this is not what they've come to us for. So it, it would be, uh, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, Jerry, I don't know that we're in a position to. Do you have an answer for this, to, Jerry? I think I do. I'm not sure. Not so. the, building, the building is being raised. The first floor and the lower portion will be parking. The uh, office. It's not inhabitable, but the office space will be raised. So the office space will be raised basically one story above ground level. Oh, the okay. ground, the ground level will only contain a garage that's five or six feet lower down, stores, and uh, restaurants. And under, under New York City zoning, that's what's allowable. As long as you have your utilities, your Portland's furnace, all that is raised. Unfortunately, stores and restaurants are expendable. Could be flooded. Could, could be flooded. Good. Good. Two questions. Um, one is regarding the waterfront access for the boats. Um, are we expecting to portage their kayaks from wherever they find parking, or is there going to be parking provided for the waterfront users? The, the parking is open. In other words, it's not. It's, it's, it'll be, you know, it'll be paid parking for okay. anyone who... So then it's really not free public access to the waterfront if you have to pay for the parking. Just getting that in there. I think there should be some spots set aside for waterfront users of the general public who yes, may or may not have money to there is pay for There is bicycle parking, but I, they did not discuss any free parking. Yeah. I mean, part of it is the way it's designed. I mean, you could tell them that they had to put cement on the on on those on those blue areas you're seeing, but then they aren't going to be as attractive as they are will be when there are rocks with the with the tide coming up. So it's kind of an it's kind of an aesthetic trade-off, really, at least in my mind. Okay, but I think they should make up those inches somewhere. Just want they to actually be actually there will be more than the required square footage that's there, it's just that in order to obtain that, they're doing this. So we're not losing, we're actually gonna have more than what the city the zoning requires in square footage. Oh, I heard that it but was not me. But when, when, okay. when, when they pull it back, the actual walkway, okay, when, in the blue areas, city planning, is the, the way the zoning's written, it doesn't allow for that, and they have to get approval to pull back those blue areas, even though the total square footage is still more than what is going to, than what's required. They, so last year, uh, I think we asked them to provide, I'm looking at you, Jerry, because we had a little conversation about this, 10% of the parking would be 
for public use. Yeah. This picks up they asked us for the reduction. And because they asked us for the reduction. Yeah. We asked them to look into it. They came back and they're not doing it. So did they actually do it? Are they doing that? They're not. not doing they're not doing it. That's why it's not part of the motion, and that's why it's not part of the, the, anything, because they are not. They looked at it, and they weren't able to do it. There was actually, if you do recall, at our last meeting, a year, two years ago, because it was December of, 2000, of 2015, um, the meeting, we had, the discussion was, well, how do you figure out who gets to use the free parking? How do you not get to figure that out? Who is the user that first come, first serve? A and it just wasn't, it wasn't an option for them in the, in the plan for what they did. So they looked into it, and they just weren't able to do it. And if our request was for them to look into it and see if it was an option, that's what was written into our motion. Yes, Ariel. Um, just a point of uh, information. I, I know that they had presented this uh, a couple of years ago, and some of the, uh, at least the Court by New York comment, I know that there was a number of people there uh, when we met out of the uh, community uh, residents who said there's an awful lot that they would love to see that this new public space, this public access area. Um, how many meetings did they have other than between that two years ago and this in terms of developing this so that it reflected uh, I, I'm not aware if they met with the community or not, to be very honest with you. They did not mention that in their presentation. It, it doesn't look a lot different, and I don't see any of the things in there that I know had, had heard two years ago, and, and that's, a, that's pretty disappointing given that it's a, you know, intended to be very public. Did you have a comment? Did you have a comment? You have a sentence? Okay. Are there any comments or questions any further? Eric? You can call. All right. Um, so uh, we have a motion before us that I will reread. Uh, to conditionally approve an application submitted to DCP for a grant of authorization pursuant to section 62-822A of the New York City Zoning Resolution to modify the location, area, and minimum dimension requirement of section 62-50, and in conjunction therewith 62-332, and an application for the grant of authorization pursuant to section 62-822B of the New York City Zoning Resolution to modify the requirements of section 62-513 and 62-60 at 280 Richard Street. The conditions for approval are as follows. The applicant commits in writing to include a public bathroom on the promenade. The applicant must enter an agreement with the New York City Department of Environmental Conservation to remediate debris currently on the site. The applicant must conduct an independent investigation into the causes of flooding on Beard Street and present their findings to the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and the applicant must cover the existing piles of dirt on the site immediately. All in favor of that lengthy motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One more time, opposed. Just one more time. Just hold your hands up. One more time. Uh, any abstentions? Two abstentions. Josh. And Mark. Mark. And one. John and Deborah. Josh. The motion, the motion passes. Uh, sure. 25 in favor, 7 opposed, 4 abstentions. There you go. Motion passes. Uh, we're going to take a brief hiatus and welcome our dueling council members. They don't have to actually duel, but uh, I'd, I'd love to have them come up and uh, address the audience. 40 faces? 10 faces? No, no, they don't really have to do it. 
Uh, if you could actually, though, use the microphone because this is all being recorded live. Love it. We're on TV. Love it. Love it. The, the broadcasts I hear are like a big hit. We've doubled the number of people that uh, take Who's part in two? community board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking we're going to do it again next year. Yes, I think it's great that we're opening up more people to seeing the community board. So if you have more ideas for how we can spread the word and get people to watch these scintillating broadcasts, but we, I'm going to, you know, it's a city, there's a city council program. I allocated some money last year so that then we're going to do it again this year. Um, I know you already talked about it um, and passed a resolution about 9th Street, but obviously so much of what has been on our mind in this community about our shared work together to keep this uh, safe and wonderful place has been that crash, which just, um, I guess I'll say like this, like, I feel that this community that we live in and that we have the honor to represent is like an extraordinary place. And, you know, most days, including today, which I'll come back to, you just feel so much uplift from doing it together. And obviously then when the whole community is grieving. It's just been a, a really rough week. Um, it was good to see so many of you out on Monday and just that really powerful act of like both grieving together but also recommitting to make it safer. Um, I appreciate the resolution you guys have already passed. Um, as you know, I spoke to Polly Trottenberg, you know, on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday of last week and she move very quickly to say that they are gonna rapidly take a look at 9th Street and come to this board with what you've asked for, a, a proposal to make it much safer. Um, and that will connect with the work on 4th Avenue that we've also been talking about and that we pushed together to make sure got extended to 8th Street this year rather than next year. So it'll be able to connect to the work that happens on 9th Street. And obviously, we'll never know if that would have saved Abigail and Joshua. Obviously, the this woman was not, you know, drove in a way that is so far beyond unacceptable, but making it safer for the future is critical. We are also gonna move forward to make sure uh, that we do more to keep reckless drivers, get reckless drivers off our streets before they can kill our kids. Um, a lot of that you've already seen being pushed. A, a lot of us in the council pushing the Daily News and the Wall Street Journal have joined the call. The mayor is gonna make some announcements about this tomorrow. A lot of it takes Albany, uh, so when, when Bobby's down here and when Joanne are down here, I think it'll be important because we can't take people's licenses or suspend their car registrations. That's one thing we hadn't talked about that much before is we're doing not enough still. We should have uh, speed zone cameras in front of every school, but even the ones we have, we haven't yet connected the dots between the license plate can you know, um, tickets and, and people's driver's licenses. So it's time to do a lot more. It's you know unbelievably heartbreaking that this is what it took to wake us up to that. One little small bright spot uh, for our community that I want to tell people about, and I had hoped to come under very different circumstances. One wonderful small program at the Reda Community Justice Center is to my knowledge like the only program in the country that is trying to take people's tickets and turn them into behavior change. They've got a little program called the Driver Accountability Program that we set up with the Justice Center and the Brooklyn DA's office uh, and takes people who got a low level ticket and instead of just having them pay it, they do a class where they see a, pretty, a really good video with family members of victims and go through a sort of structured exercise that they report um, really changes behavior and we just got the first data back and it looks like there's about a 40% recidivism reduction from this program. So we'll come back with folks from Red Hook and talk about that as well because I really think we want to do it at sort of both ends. Obviously those people with records like this woman and even worse need to not be driving. Uh, but those people like a lot of us and I'll just own it too that you know sometimes drive in a reckless way, need to have interventions that get us to change our behavior so we don't become drivers like that. And that's widespread, so um, more to come on that in the future. Um, on quick and more hopeful notes, um, the, um, I know I saw Mike last night at the District 15 school uh, integration, middle school integration workshops. It is a serious process. And you know, Carlos and I were both there. They've had two of the four public workshops. Anybody else been to one? All right, so talk to, to Suzanne or, or Mike about it. Go to public workshop three or four. It is about the realist conversation 
about race and education and segregation that I've seen. They've both been at Sunset Park High School. Really, a lot of work has gone into making sure it's a diverse set of people that are there, having like a real data and a real honest conversation. So pretty powerful, um, and I urge people to, to be a part of it. Um, if you haven't yet signed our Save 236 and 238 President Street petition, please do it because we're going to do a little more there. I think we're going to talk about doing some kind of public action. We got to get more notice to that before we lose the lose those buildings. So I'm really calling on the LPC, but uh, we could use more support and voice from the neighborhood. Um, there's some things that may be able to wait until we have a chance to talk more broadly about the Gowanus plan, but there's some things that can't because they're at risk in the nearer future. So sign up for that. More to come, obviously, in Gowanus. Um, and then just finally, Megan will give you the details on participatory budgeting vote week, so I won't do that. But um, uh, today was just so powerful. I, I think a lot of people have been watching on social media. Um, I was at middle school 51, where the middle school kids just organized this just silent, beautiful, emotional event. The borough president hosted something in Prospect Park after school. And if you haven't watched what happened at John Jay High School, uh, where the kids were out on the street when the PS321 kids marched by on the other side of the street, like, watch when you go home tonight, like you will, I dare you not to cry or at least tear up. It's, uh, it's kind of the most heartwarming thing I've seen in quite some time and happened right here in Community Board 6. So uh, take a watch when you go home tonight. Thank you, Brad. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be here before you. Um, I, I think that where I want to start actually is the walkout as well. I, I spent my time at MS88. Uh, there's a super mega campus there that has both New Voices and MS88. It's outside of, of the community board, but um, I, I think it kind of speaks to the entire borough and the entire city and the entire nation that kind of came out. Uh, the young people in, from New Voices and MS88 and PS295, young first, second, fifth graders were out with their parents. Everyone joined and sang uh, and, and read their names and, and, and had a moment of silence. And I, I just, it was a reminder of two things. One is that we need more young people in spaces like this. Uh, there was just a vote that just happened on land use. We need young people here. Uh, they're already going to start advising me on Industry City. Uh, they, they want gun control legislation to get past the city level. They want to figure out what the municipal government can do. They're smart. Uh, and it'll be a disgrace to us as adults to not, 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 just, not just invite them, but really make sure that we're intentional about how we can get them into these spaces. And so I hope that's a commitment. I'm making that commitment. I think Brad is too. Let's all make that commitment and figure out how we can make that happen. Um, it's hard. Uh, I know I've, I've, I have appointed young people to this community board and they don't stay. Uh, they well, and they graduate high school. That's, that, that, in, in, a, in, a, in a particular case, that's true. Um, but there's a way to figure out how we can make that happen. And if the system needs to change, I think we need to do that. Um, and I hope we can work together to make that happen. Uh, participatory budgeting is, is coming, and I'm super excited uh, to also announce that at the city council, I'm also uh, a new leader in PB uh, with Brad and all the council members. Um, but I'm really excited that I, I kind of get, get to kind of work with the whole city council to figure out how we bring more resources, because it works. You have three council members here that bring those resources to bring community members into rooms, think about ideas, and then make them happen. Uh, it's been incredible. I was just at a conference in Phoenix to talk about what is happening in New York and where we are the shining example. And it's all of you who are making that happen. Uh, April, uh, April 6th through the 15th is vote week. Get ready. Come out and support. Uh, and maybe this year Brad's district will be more, uh, more engaged than mine. Who knows? Uh, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> you got really close with all those online votes that came in from, you know, from, from people at home. Uh, where ours are paper ballots uh, in Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, mostly. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a healthy competition and it's an opportunity for everybody to participate. This is where we duel. Uh, what else? Another leadership position that I have in the city council, and I'm going to be working with Brad as well, I'm the chair of this new task force committee um, that will soon come out on the BQX. Uh, the BQX is, uh, goes through Community Board 6, uh, and it's caused a lot of questions and thoughts and inspiration and consternation 
And so what we're going to be doing is bringing the force of the city council and resources. We have a whole team at the city council at Central Staff. They're going to help analyze this and do it city council way. We, we, we provide oversight, and we're going to do that. And so we're going to be working with the community board. Uh, more details are going to get hashed out, so I'm going to be working with your team, your, your, your kind of leadership team here, to make sure that we bring everybody on board and bring an avenue. Uh, I think that's it for me right now. Thank you. And looking forward to next month and uh, reporting on the winners for the PB, uh, for PB initiative. Thank you. One question. When do you expect yes. the ULERPs for BQX to start rolling? <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a billion, $2.5 billion question. Um, yeah, I, I do not foresee anything real in the near future at all. Uh, and that's if I was the biggest supporter of it, and I have a lot of concerns mm -hmm. about the BQX. So um, not anytime soon. Okay. And, and I think that's the first thing we're going to start uh, uh, kind of analyzing is the kind of land use component. There's a whole financial component. And the first thing we're going to do is just begin the conversations and the kind of outreach at the community board levels um, in communities and bring the actual kind of uh, uh, public hearing processes into the neighborhoods along the corridor. And the thing that I want you to think about when you think about the BQX, this, this, this committee, this task force, is really asking the question about transportation along the corridor. We want to think about this because this is ultimately what the BQX is saying that's answering. They're answering a question about transportation. We're going to ask the question about transportation and get to the BQX. And so it's a different kind of, per, it's, a, it's a kind of ground up discussion, and we're really excited to be engaging all of you about it. Thank you. Thank you. That made me just realize a couple other tidbits. Um, in addition to the President's Street petition, I think most folks have already signed the B-71 petition that we are all working Thank together you. on the community yeah. board, Carlos' office, my office, lots of folks here. But that's like a grassroots, ground up, like can happen right now. So it doesn't take, a, you know, billions of dollars of infrastructure investment. So we're going to keep pushing that. Um, uh, just on time, but I, I don't, you know, I'd like all of you, I'm waiting to see when the, um, Gowanus framework comes out from city planning. It's not impossible it'll happen between now and next month's meeting. Originally it said December, and now it's kind of slipped a few months. Obviously we'll work closely, you know, we've worked so closely together giving them input, so seeing whether they took our input in the framework. Yeah. I hope so. Uh, I, I, I want to keep hopeful that they, that they will have, but you know, we'll see it when it comes. And then um, I just want to give credit where it's due, uh, especially on Monday night and kind of the organizing of the community in the aftermath to transportation alternatives and families for safe streets, especially those family members, um, to Park Slope Neighbors that was a sponsor, to the UFT that sponsored Monday night. There was a, it was a really like, we stand up in front, but the organizing to make that happen happened from the grassroots and the co-sponsors. And I just um, really want to give credit. And in that same vein today, you know, what was so powerful uh, was the kids did this um, and watching young people lead and push us to take a step back and listen, pretty powerful. So. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Back to land use. Back to more, back to more mundane matters. <laughs> um, the next uh, application is um, 288 Fourth Avenue. Um, this is on the Gowanus side of 4th Avenue, so the property also backs onto Denton Place, which is a little tiny little street that runs a block um, that runs parallel to 4th Avenue. So this is a one-story building, um, and what they want to do is they want to add, um, they want to bring it up to four stories, so it would go from 5,700 square feet and change to 20,000 square feet and change and they want to use it for office space and what is called a community facility but is essentially a medical office. And the zoning calls for them to have 50 parking places and they want to reduce that to 25. And this is a, I mean the subway is, you know, is literally a, a block or two away. This is 4th Avenue between uh, Carroll and 1st so it is well served by the subway. The bus on Fifth Avenue is a block away. Um, so 
we did not feel that you know what they were asking and it would be a, you know it would be attended parking part of it would some of these cars would be all on one level but these would be a, a two layer row of, uh, of vehicles and we felt that you know certainly 25 parking spaces was um, well more than uh, than adequate um, so we approved it as presented 1200 you had um, so you had we yeah, did have we did have a quorum. I believe we lost a quorum during um, land marks, okay. but during land use we had a quorum. Shocking. Um, all right. Uh, so we have quorum. We have a motion. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? Yeah. Uh, are any of those parking spots reserved for staff and positions? It would be it would be a mixture. In other words, I. Uh, I believe that some of them would be reserved. I, they, they didn't use the word reserved in the sense that they said, oh, there's 25 parking places and X are for this and X are for that. Because they've not rented the facility yet, they don't know what the demand is. But again, uh, you know, uh, it it's, would be a, an easy place to commute to by public transportation, subway or bus. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I don't anticipate that there would be that many people maybe you know, the owner of a facility. Um, but again, since they don't know who they're renting it to, they didn't address that. Um, would this change in the future to the parking spots now? They, 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 this is a facility they're building. Essentially it's, a, uh, essentially, it's a garage at this point, And they are looking to turn it into an office and medical facility. So they're completely changing the use of the space. The community is not no, the community is not losing. This is. Again, this is a, an, auto, an auto repair place, so this is space that they're, they're creating. It's two buildings that are next to each other on two separate, separate tax lots. Yep. Is this application before the BSA or now? Uh, I believe so, yes. There is a... Uh, it has not been approved yet. Uh, it has not been approved yet, no. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Sorry. That's between First and Carroll. It's on the Gowanus side of 4th Avenue, not on the Park Slope side. Any other? No? Uh, I carry no. 3 44 of the New York City Zoning Resolution to permit the reduction of accessory parking spaces for the proposed altered building at 288 4th Avenue with uses in the parking requirements sub category B1. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We are on to landmarks. The uh, first landmarks issue is a building on the corner of, well, it's 76, 78 St. Mark's, but it's as you come up Flappish Avenue, it's where 6th Avenue comes in, so it's right on that little triangle. There's no buildings on the triangle, so you see it from Flappish Avenue. Uh, driving past, you might think it's part of 6th Avenue, but it's actually St. Mark's. Uh, farm is what's there now, uh, and I think it was a bar on this side. Now, um, their front, go ahead to what they're going to do. Uh, it's both cast iron and uh, stone, so, so the cast iron is going to be painted black. Uh, the stone is being cleaned up. Um, keep going. I want to see the uh, proposed fronts. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Now, keep going backwards. Yeah, we passed it quickly. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where the right side that was farm is going to be a front looking like the old storefronts with a little recessed doorway in between two glass windows, the entrance to the building, uh, the apartment houses is in the middle, and they don't have a separate uh, exit or a second uh, exit from the apartment house. So what they're going to do is use a double doorway here in this side of the building. So this is still going to be rentable as a business. And this, what used to be one doorway is now two. This will go straight to the backyard, and the backyard uh, is going to be built over, and we'll see that in a minute, uh, 
and it's a commercial uh, property, they're allowed to build a full lot. Uh, so they're going to build the first floor. Right now it's being used as backyard space for eating space for farm, uh, which is not going to be there anymore. So this is a doorway that goes straight through uh, to the backyard. And when we look at the backyard thing, we'll see that. Most of this has been approved verbally, not officially yet, with uh, talking to staff at LPC. Most of this work is fine. Uh, we had no problem with this work, uh, the front work. Okay, moving to the back. Okay, this is St. Mark's right here, Flappish Avenue. This is Park Place. You can see down the back of Park Place. Okay, here's a better. Stop. <laughs> Go back to what we just had. Okay, this is Park Place looking down. What they want to do is take that whole back and build a one story extension, again, allowable as commercial. Um, and the backyards uh, or the back exit uh, for the apartments through the fire escapes will go down. You'll walk along the edge and then get back into the building. There'll be there's, uh, better pictures of it or uh, breakdown later, but I want to see what it looks like in context to the rest of the buildings. So you'd be coming down and then going through the building directly to that doorway in the front. Keep going. Okay, that's the uh, picture if I can figure out. Okay, go ahead. These are existing. There won't be anything like that anymore because uh, they're not going to have it level in the back. Keep going. These are existing again. Uh, this, stop, 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 go back. Okay, this is looking down Park Place. Their property is back here, which is now a fence. Uh, well, they will now be a brick wall, and this is pretty far down. It's the whole length of the buildings. Uh, it's about five or six building-wise. You can see the, the buildings here. Um, so it's far back. What we ask, though, is not to be just a concrete uh, cinder block uh, wall, but to make it a brick-faced wall, whether it be the solid brick or half brick is up to them. But we did want it to look uh, nicer for the people living around it and anyone walking by. So that's pretty much our only condition to it. Okay, go ahead through. I think. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, we had uh, one condition for approval, which is the applicant may use brick or the brick veneer on the visible sides of the rear yard extension. Uh, so that was the only condition we put on it. The front we thought looked great. The back looks good. We just would like that brick put in. Um, we did not have a quorum. Uh, we lost one or two people between the. Uh, oh, the, okay. One, two. Okay, I'm sorry. We still did. So there was a quorum, and it uh, passed. I think seven or eight. Somebody have the minutes. Eight to two. Yeah. Lost track. Yes, the second one, no quorum. Right, no quorum. Okay. All right, so we need a motion from the floor regarding 60. So moved. Thank you. Um, are there any comments? Is there a second? Okay, great. Now let's talk about it. Any comments or questions? Yes. Can you just distinguish between, I'm sorry, Bob, <laughs> between brick veneer and brick? The brick veneer would be half thickness just covering over cement, a uh, cinder block wall so that it looks like brick from... Are you talking about the thin brick? Yeah. Okay. That we, we rejected that on another uh, application. Yes, but that would have been because of a backyard that really we're looking at closely. This is just, they have the right to put in, uh, yeah, it's five buildings back, and it was from that far back we didn't feel uh, veneer mat it matted. It's just a, a look as you're going down Park Place to look uh, look down the whole uh, backyard. You're going, you're looking through five backyards to see it. Any yeah. other um, <laughs> comments or questions? Yes. Uh, I live on the block, just across Sixth Avenue, and my only concern was that none of the neighbors concerning the backyard extension had any notification and they felt they didn't need it. I'm, I'm asking that 
if you're going to do any sort of uh, construction in the backyard, your neighbors should be aware of what you're going to do. And, and clarify, Bob, uh, uh, are we talking about Prospect Place or Park Place? I'm sorry, Prospect Place. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, my fault. I taught too many years on Park Place, I think, in that name. But, um, they did say they did put up signs and they followed the uh, rules that we have. They spoke to Ty. Ty gave them the rules. Our rules are very limited in terms of a 50-foot circle around the... What? 500 feet, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's not... It, it's, that's only for major work. Um, it's really only the few neighbors, I think. Um, but we are thinking about in the future looking at that and seeing if we can get a larger. But they, uh, that they, but they did the yes, whatever Ty told them to do. Yes, we did yeah. ask. Is the commercial use going to remain the same for the property? It won't be the same farm, no. but it will be a, probably a restaurant. Uh, no. That came up a couple of times, but unfortunately, that was their decision to do. Uh, you know, for the few months that you are outside, from looking, I guess, from a rental point of view, they have now a much larger building. Uh, they things will be on top. Mechanicals will be on top of that roof. By the way, it just reminded me that. It, was a problem for neighbors in that we had a noise problem with the dining outside, so I think they probably took that into consideration. And actually, being a hollow space like that, that discussion did come up on how the noise travels through that backyard, so it's not a wide open space the way you would think of. Uh, for uh, any other? Uh, did I see a hand? Daniel, did I see your hand? Um, I just have a concern about the notice issue. So here, and any other? Hearing none, I'm going to call for a vote. We have a motion to approve the application submitted to, nope, sorry, that wrong. Motion to conditionally approve a C of A to LPC for storefront facade renovations, a new secondary egress door, and a rear yard extension at 76-82 St. Mark's Avenue in the Park Slope Historic District. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, any abstentions? All right, the motion passes. Okay. Second landmarks issue was 608 Fifth Street between uh, 8th and Prospect Park West. Wait, I'll look at that way. So make sure everybody sit sideways. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's to put a rooftop addition. Actually, a bulkhead they don't consider the rooftop addition. Uh, and okay. I'm looking for okay, that's the old tax lot to it. And they want to take off the stained glass window that's in the back here and put it on to the top of this. Ex the, they're not really calling an extension, a rooftop extension. It's the uh, bulkhead, but we had a problem with it in terms of it's rather big for the bulkhead. And LPC, when we met with them, uh, said more or less we should be looking at ones that these are more like rooms, to use their terms, rather than just a bulkhead. It's 16 feet by, uh, I think, 8 feet. Three feet wide by 16 feet long um, on it. So they are changing some of these windows, using these stained glass windows for the top. Uh, we had no problem with these changes in the back. Um, but we did have a problem with the size and the bulk 
of the extension on top, which is also visible to some extent. So we felt that it should either be pushed back a little bit or made smaller, and that was our condition for it. Um, again, we didn't have a quorum, and the vote was seven to two. Uh, eight, uh, yes, one no, one abstention. We need a motion from the floor. Second? Second. All right, there's a second. Um, can I just ask my, the first question, and then I'll open it up, because I can call on me first. Um, what does less visible mean? Does that mean not visible, or does that mean so, kind of visible? It's, we're leaving that up to LPC. If they can push it back so that the edge I'm, is visible. I'm voting against this resolution. Okay. Just, I'm voting against this motion. Just on principle. Why not? Why? Why can't we say what we want? Because We look, live here. It's a bulkhead that they do need to put now, so there has to be at least an eight foot there, so it might be visible without it. Without a choice no, for bulkhead. Because bulk we're protecting head. our landmark districts. Fine. And if you don't want to protect our landmark districts, please don't come back and try to increase it. Please do not come back as a committee and say that you want to increase a landmark districts in our neighborhood if we're not going to protect what the what the laws are, what we what we need to protect as a group. I'm, I'm tired of this committee bringing this to us every single time. Sorry, uh, who's uh, who else? Okay, can I answer? Do you want me to answer? No, that, that wasn't a question. Okay, Eric. Well, you're told. There's, there's no bulkhead currently. And no, the and any changes is for stair access to the roof. Yes, which is not our yeah, their fault or our fault. That's a de uh, Department of Buildings requirement. Now you have to come up with. A larger access. You can't just do the little raise up the metal like I still have because I haven't done any work on, it, on my ceiling. If I did any work, I'd need a bulkhead, so we don't have a choice sometimes. Daniel, I'm going to join us. Why does the committee have no issue with the movement of the stained glass windows? Um, they're really minor, two little ones on the side, um, and they still are going to be used. But they're part of the original design of the building? No. Uh, I, no? I don't think these were added, I think, later. Yes. I share Sire's concerns <laughs> about the uh, bulkhead and uh, I do too, and I would just ask that the committee specify a specific reduction in size. Like you said, it had to be eight feet. That should be in here, so that's what we're voting on. It's going to be that, you know, eight feet to meet building department requirements. The question would be seen, though, so that's what we're saying. No, no, it gets I just want a number to vote on. I don't want reduced and less. And, you know, I want it's not our job to tell them how many feet it should so, be. So uh, I just want to comment on some of the other comments. The landmark law allows for changes. It allows for additions. The reason these come to us is for us to consider whether they show, and if they do show uh, from the public way, that they do not detract or take away from the historic character of the neighborhood. So it's okay that there's something on the roof if it's required by building code. We want to make it minimally visible if we can, and we want to make sure that it looks appropriate. It's not, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, chrome plated and, and, you know, an eyesore. Uh, as far as the windows on that rear extension, they're certainly not original because that. Uh, extension is not, you know, original to the building, and it's on the uh, west-facing side of the building, so that they're, they're not very visible, except if you're standing in the backyard of the, you know, next two houses, perhaps. Uh, so the fact that they're reconfiguring the space and wanted to remove the windows, they're still keeping the windows. They're putting them up top. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. If I No, they really just weren't. Right. Just, the just yeah. the backyard. If you walked around the side of it. This yeah. was like beautifully done. I mean, there were like very staunch landmark people in the room. Beautifully done. This was not a carelessly designed or in any way ostentatiously designed project. It was really, really well done. Putting that up there. This, well, so just to pick up on all these points, I mean, either the rooftop bulkhead dish was acceptable as, as presented, and I understand Deb's point, or it wasn't. And I think that's the decision we have to make. I, we're not there to design it for them, uh, although sometimes I am prone to. <laughs> <laughs> but, we all are. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not clear what, I'm sorry, again, I wasn't at the meeting, but what we thought, if we didn't like it, if the committee didn't like it, then we just said, we don't like it, you have to come back to us with something that's better. It's, if we're, we're trying to well, expedite things, I think. We don't usually have the luxury, if we tell them we don't like it, to come back. It's done, therefore, at Landmarks, uh, and the changes are made there, and we don't often, and rarely do we see the changes that, uh, that are made. But they will listen to us many times, and like the 10th Street one was tabled, uh, and they had, which meant that they were working on still instead of the la coming to the last uh, hearing. So they do look at what we ask them to do. Some of the options to make it less visible from the street would be move it back a little bit. Might not even be the height if it moved back a couple of things, uh, feet. So we can't tell them move it back or do that or make it shorter. We just have to suggest landmarks look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, where the stained glass windows are being removed and neighbors can see it, are they using replacement windows? Or are they going to break it over? Or what's the plan? I think it was a plan window. And the neighbors couldn't even see it because it's over on the side. Uh, you know, you have to be, at the most, one neighbor might be able to see it. Uh, any other comments or questions on this? Where is this visible? The, the top they pointed it out. I did, do, uh, Ty, do you have the, the shots from that? You want the bulk of the. Well, they show it. There was a drawing that showed. There were photos with uh, the mock up. There. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah. Well, that's from the roof, so. Uh, but there were. Yeah, keep going. That, those are close ups of it. Yeah, you could barely see it, but it was uh, pretty much through this backyard. You can see it right there. Uh, and that's off of, I think. Is that in the left photo of the pier? Uh, I don't think so, no. It's in the very rear of the property. Yeah. Yeah, so where are we looking from in that right photo? Uh, should be. So the plan. Park. Can we get a diagram? I think it's down across the park. This is a view from Fifth Street. What does that say in blurry writing there at the bottom of each one of the photos? It's view from Fifth Street. View from Fifth Street. View from Fifth Street. Yeah. I think that's over the, uh, the driveway, where the backyards are to the backyard. And those blank photos they gave us are? <laughs> Prospect Park and the block plan. Okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions? Can we? Yeah. All right. Nicole, we can vote on this one. Uh, recommendation. You did not, and we have that, so we're good. Uh, recommendation to conditionally approve a C of A for LPC in the new rooftop staircase bulkhead, new windows, and first floor double door at 608 Fifth Street, Prospect Park Historic District, with the condition that they reduce the size of the staircase bulkhead from front to rear so as to be less visible from the street. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Six. Six. Uh, abstentions? Uh, I have no idea. It looked like, like okay. eight people voted. Can, I ask <laughs> Can the notices raise their hand again? Is it? Safe to assume that everybody else who didn't say I is actually an I, and that we have the number of votes for a yes on this one. Real quick, can everybody who's voting yes just raise your hand real quick? Yeah, okay, it passes. Um, okay, a recommendation to uh, let's go to the next one. The next is a uh, asking for a letter to LPC to look at. 236 
and 238 President Street, um, which was alluded to by Brad Lander earlier. Uh, there are two buildings. Can we get the pictures, Tom? They are the Brooklyn Deaconess Home and Training School uh, for the, of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Hans S. Christian uh, Memorial, which was a kindergarten. It's two buildings. Um, that's one, that's the other. Okay. It's these two buildings. Um, there is a number of uh, documented historical as well as uh, architectural reasons to keep it. We are not voting on deciding whether or not it will be, should be landmarked or not. We're only asking the LPC to look into it. If they decide yes, they'll be coming back to us to present the case, and then we will actually take a vote on whether or not we feel it should be or not. But it is apparently up for sale, uh, apparently has been sold. The developers have been publicly saying that they will be tearing them down. So we would like LPC, just the one. And in the meantime, we did send a letter, again, for time's sake, we sent a letter to DOB and LPC to consult and have a stay of execution on the building that's being torn down until LPC can determine whether it does have any merit or value to recommend it to come back to us. You didn't have quorum, correct? Uh, no. All right. So we need a motion for the floor to discuss this. So. All right. All right, I can go into plenty of details, which I'm not at the point. I uh, could read you yep. two, a two-page letter. Okay. Yep. I, I would like to address this because I've done a lot of research on it. Um, when this was built, there were no free kindergartens uh, in New York City. There were no public school kindergartens. It was a new concept. There was a movement that went with the settlement house movement to create free kindergartens as part of an uh, you know, really a social reform movement. Um, this was one of the first uh, purpose-built buildings built as a kindergarten. Uh, it took three decades before public schools were mandated to include uh, kindergartens. This was a historic site. And it's not just an aesthetically, architecturally interesting building, and unfortunately there's that garage there, but it is historically important. It was named after the husband of the owner, uh, Mr. Christian, uh, Hans S. Christian, and his wife did uh, start the first kindergarten, not here, uh, and then this was like their next kindergarten, so it's one of the first kindergartens in Brooklyn. Yep. So our understanding is that the developer intends to tear down the small building yes. and not the larger one? Correct. It's the, it's the one on the right is the only one that is for sale, perhaps sold already. I just have to say, if anybody on this board was present at the time and voted in favor of the garage, shame on you. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was done a long time ago. Yeah, and it's not, yep. it's not on the landmark block. So. Uh, any other comments or questions? No, hearing none. All right, we have a recommendation, well, now a motion, to request that LPC expeditiously consider the individual landmarking application for 236 and 238 President Street to determine if they should be reviewed for such consideration by our board and referred back to us. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nice. I'm not the only one sometimes. Uh, any abstentions? No? All right, the motion passes. Thank you. All right, Mike, let's make this happen. All right. All right, uh, permits and licensing. Uh, this month we have five applications, all of which were basically approved unanimously, <laughs> with one exception that one was disapproved unanimously. Uh, so I'll go through that. First up, we have 127 Columbia Street. Uh, this is in the old Pock Pock place. Uh, their space, when they initially opened up on Columbia Street, they, um, they had come to us uh, the month before, we felt they hadn't done sufficient outreach. They are adding a bar to their backyard. They already serve liquor in the backyard. It's just that now the bar will be there. So they came to us, the outreach this time, they demonstrated a great deal more, and uh, it was approved unanimously. You had quorum? Yeah, oh yes, we had quorum for all of these. Okay. Uh, we have any comments or questions? 
Yeah. All right. We have a motion to approve a new on-premise liquor license submitted to the SLA on behalf of Popina NYC LLC at 127 Columbia Street. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. All right. Uh, next up, we have at 408 uh, Fifth Avenue. This is a, the name of the LLC is different. It's so it's Vario 408 at 412 Fifth Avenue between 7th and 8th Streets for a sidewalk cafe of four tables and eight seats. Um, pretty normal conversation. Uh, it was not much opposition. Approved unanimously. It's currently operating there. Any comments or questions? Yep. This place serves my favorite tacos in all of New York. <laughs> so when you, if you were to ever, you know, have the honor of joining this committee, what you can do is then say, like, will you keep that on the menu? While it is not binding, it's fun. I have enjoyed asking such questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other? Uh, very good any other? Uh, any, any other comments on this one? No? Uh, all right, we motion to approve an alteration to an existing on-premise liquor license submitted to the SLA, and an application to Consumer Affairs to permit a sidewalk cafe of four tables and eight chairs on behalf of Barrio 408 at 412 Fifth Avenue. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. All right, uh, next up is, like, right next door. It's the same owner uh, on-premise Presentation and review of an alteration of a current on-premise liquor license for 408 Fifth Avenue between 7th and 8th. We just did 408. No, no, that's the LLC was 408. We did 412. Yeah, no, I was I, I was jet lagged and very confused at the meeting, so I am apologizing for transferring that over to you or anyone aside from Jerry. Uh, so same thing here: five tables, ten seats, sidewalk cafe. Just too old. Anyways, what was it about? Yeah. Unanimous. Yeah. Unanimous. Unanimous. Uh, all right. Any comments or questions? Yeah. Of course. Didn't you just say that he was the same, the, the, the same owner of the first one? Yes. He just said that. So then now uh, he, he owns two of them? Yeah. So he wants to open up a, a, well, the same thing again? Down sidewalk the cafe. Sidewalk. He just wants to open a sidewalk cafe at a second business, at another business. It happens to be his neighbor, but they are two separate businesses. Oh, they're two separate businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, it, it's not. The first one was, confusing. interestingly enough, the name of the business is the address of the second one. <laughs> but they are two separate LLCs. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's some amazing tax stuff going on there. Uh, any other comments or questions? No? All right, let's vote. Uh, we have a motion to approve an alteration of an existing on-premise liquor license and submission to the SLA and an application to Consumer Affairs to permit a sidewalk cafe with five tables and ten chairs on behalf of Chella at 408 Fifth Avenue. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. All right. Uh, next up, we have our biannual tradition of uh, Woodlands. What about these other ones? On the minutes, it's... Oh, what I have, it's 442. Oh. Let's do that one last. It was because I didn't thank you to start it. That's the problem. Okay, so which one do we have on the slide? I'll go by the slides. It's easy. 75A. Uh, this is a Brooklyn Juice Company, 75A Fifth Avenue. Uh, pretty benign. They're going to add, I guess, to some of these juice drinks and concoctions, <laughs> alcohol. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's going to be paired. They seem to have some idea about pairing it with music. Uh, I didn't know any of the artists they were naming. I felt very unhip, but I often do. And uh, it was approved unanimously by our committee. All right. Any questions? Really? None? All right. Uh, we got a motion. What, motion to approve an on-premise liquor license application submitted to the SLA on behalf of Brooklyn, of the Brooklyn Juice Company, LLC, at 75A Fifth Avenue. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Okay. 215, uh, 215 Columbia. Columbia Street. Yeah. This was most recently uh, Toby's. It's been a few things through the years. It's on uh, Columbia Street between Sackett and Union. Uh, there's no outdoor space. Um, like it says in the minutes, uh, a gastro pub, uh, pretty small space, and we approved it unanimously. 
and they have a pretty cool brick oven that I think has been there through a few iterations of it, so they could make uh, good pizza that I've had there. I, mean, I don't know about the new people, but no outdoor space. No outdoor space. Uh, any questions other than that one? No? Um, all right, we have a motion to approve a new on-premise liquor license application submitted to the State Liquor Authority on behalf of Waterfront Partners, LLC, at 215 Columbia Street. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? Uh, I, I'm abstaining on this one. Uh, all right, and now we're down to it. Oh, the motion passes. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, all right, go for it. The annual, well, the biannual uh, application that is Prime Six, also known as Woodlands, uh, 242 Flatbush Avenue, between Sixth Avenue and Bergen Street. Uh, as always, there was a big turnout from the community for this application. Um, <clears throat> I do not believe there was anyone, anyone from the community there to speak in favor of it. The same issues persist, uh, meaning loud, you know, the backyard space, everything goes way too loud. They go not necessarily past hours, but they have things that initially, like I think at first they promised no bottle service and then people are saying, well, you're promising bottle service in your uh, social media campaigns and things of that nature. So within this discussion, uh, Glenn, who also took the minutes and I didn't thank him uh, and I'll thank him now, but offered up a restriction of their hours saying like if you, bring your hours in a fair amount. If there is a noticeable improvement, and when we reach out to the community, there is you know, uh, a positive response, we would be okay with that. You know, then we, they, they would not agree to it. Um, and with that, we voted to unanimously disapprove the application. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, just one question. The SLA acted on this already or not? They have. They have. Favorably, favorably for them. We requested them to halt, and they did not. They did not yeah, adhere okay. to us. Can we also include in our motion that in the future we would like the SLA to wait for our input or, or something? Because it, it's like, why are we? We, no, I, I hear what you're saying, but we have, se I think with it, they weren't scheduled to go until after they I'd heard like to direct us to our state elected officials who happen to yeah. still be in the room who are going to speak to us for a while after this, after we get through our set of things. Mm -hmm. This is a concern for our community. People in our neighborhood are not happy with this establishment. We send letters to the SLA and the SLA actually says, we don't care, we're collecting money, and they rubber stamp this. Woodlands has been an issue for a long time. Some of our elected officials have not listened to us on this. I, I, I ask you, as representatives of our city of, in, at the state, please talk to the SLA about this establishment because we've done all we can. Our voice is not being heard. I encourage you to please do something to help our community. We recently, had, a number of us met with, this is the city, LPC, Landmarks Preservation, and they agreed that they will wait until we, the yep. applicant comes before us and we vote, which makes sense. Otherwise, why write us into the rules, regulations, or law? Uh, it, it seems like you guys are spinning your wheels, uh, and, the, and the community is spinning their wheels, and maybe we should also make sure that the community understands they have to put in complaints like crazy. Right. Yeah, well, I, my understanding is they have been on that. Okay, I'm yeah. not sure. No, yeah. I, I, I got you. Karen, I saw you. I'm, I'm it should be done in advance. If, if you're getting, if, if the board is getting called about time six, then the board should immediately reach out to an elected official. You we have. have. There's a task force created on Woodlands that elected officials who represent the area sit on. It exists. We have. We're just not getting the support from them. 
Uh, yeah, that, there's, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> There's a, uh, another major issue that didn't come up in the community complaints, but I know other neighbors from the area and they witness on a regular basis vis visibly drunk people staggering down the street, getting into cars and driving away. There's a major DWI issue here as well. Mm. Right. So, and I understand that the police are called there quite often for real disturbances and, you know, so they're we understand that there are complaints. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's why I think our board acted accordingly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. As somebody who lives around the corner, there are so many grievances the community has against this establishment. You will wake up in the morning and you'll have feces on your front step. You'll have vomit on your front step. So some of these mothers, and my neighbor said to me, am I aware that women are sitting between cars and urinating on the block? I said, I'm not surprised. Because when they leave the establishment, they're so inebriated, they don't know what they're doing. And if you ever go out on 6th Avenue on a Sunday, between 1 and 3, you would be surprised at the, the, the crowds that you see that don't live in the neighborhood. They come in the neighborhood. They don't care where they park. They don't care about young children in the neighborhood or those of us who live in the neighborhood. And yes, our elected officials, we have complained starting from the top, which is the mayor's office, all the way down to all our elected officials have been called in to dialogue on this facility and they will do squat. Yeah, and Pauline, just to, to speak to that point, when I said the uh, offer of the hours, I thought this was interesting um, that based on the complaints in the room, the biggest issue was with actually with brunch hours. And the offer, the offer that was made was to close the backyard space one hour earlier. It opened four hours later on Sunday on conditions approved, which is, I mean, that's usually not the case, but apparently I think they have a, uh, a bottomless brunch and things of that nature. Yeah, this goes back to when I was the chair of the Permits and License Committee. We have had numerous meetings and community meetings. And the bid was involved, and the public officials were involved. Um, and we had some initial hope of, of accommodation with certain of our requests, most of which are not enforceable by the SLA. Uh, but which they indicated they would go along with, and they have failed to honor their initial agreements that couldn't be put into the liquor license, so therefore not enforceable by the SLA. Most of the problems that we have, which I think are serious problems, are quality of life problems that are enforceable by the police department, and um, it is, it is, if you change some of the SLA rules, perhaps we could get more uh, positive results. But as it stands, uh, I, I really do think it's, it's, it's a, a police department public safety issue. Nonetheless, I am very glad that it has been disapproved. And we'll vote for the disapproval for what it's worth, which is not a hell of a lot. Uh, I was also on the committee when this was originally approved, and my recollection was that Prime 6 was the original concept which the community board, or the committee rejected, which was to have the sort of club-like atmosphere that it turned into. Um, they changed the concept to Woodlands, which was supposed to be like a farm-to-table, family-friendly restaurant, and it kind of was that for the first year or so. Um, I used to go there myself with my infant. Um, and then it turned into the brunches and the parties and you know, the college-like alcohol signs outside and the velvet rope and the bottles and everything else. Um, so I would vote against this just for the mere fact that they defrauded the community board from the outset and pulled the bait and switch on us. Um, let alone the fact that we have to pay our police officers to babysit them and sit on the corner when they should be out doing other things uh, to protect us and deal with things like traffic safety. Um, I think in addition to voting this down, for what it's worth, we should include in our motion 
that we ask the SLA to reopen um, their consideration on this and to hold a public hearing uh, on their application. And that we, of course, send this to all of our electors. That's perfect. Uh, I don't know where the motion came from from the floor. You got you brought the motion from the floor? <laughs> okay, so there, will you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yeah. All right, perfect. We'll add that um, to our motion itself. Um, are there any other, anybody wants to comment on this? All right, so we have a motion to uh, deny an application for renewal of a current on-premise liquor license submitted to the SLA on behalf of Prime 6 Incorporated at 240 Flatbush. All in favor of the denial? Aye. Aye. All opposed? To the denial, thus, in, yeah, okay. Uh, any abstentions? We have an abstention. Uh, the motion carries the license approval has been denied by us. Well, in, the name of, in the name of progress, I should mention, unlike last time, the applicant did bring applications for the board. That's right. Last time he told us, you know our space already. Yes, that's right. So. That's right. Um, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, one more um, committee, Transportation and Public Safety. Okay, um, we have we had one item come to us uh, last month. It is consider consideration of a proposal by the New York City Department of Transportation for a bike corral to be located on 7th Street near the corner of 4th Avenue. That um, is actually the public school 118. Um, this was a request that came from the students, parents, and administration of public school 118. The students gathered 130 signatures in support of the application. Uh, parents distributed notifications on several mornings uh, outside the school so that neighbors were aware of the situation. Um, the background on this is that there were a large number of kids coming to school with their parents by bike or scooter and a number of uh, the staff also commuting by bicycle. Uh, they would store the bikes and scooters in the schoolyard and they got to be so many of them that they didn't really have the space for it. So the administration said they could no longer do that, but they don't have enough space inside the school to store that. So a lot of people who were scooting or riding bikes to school were no longer able to do so. Um, this corral will uh, accommodate, uh, it, it's a standard bike corral with four bike racks, um, planter protected uh, in front and in back, will allow for you know, eight, adult size bicycles, probably double that number of kid sized bikes and, and or, or scooters. Um, so it, it will help uh, alleviate the situation there. Um, it will replace one parking space that is currently designated for school parking. And the, the administration was very supportive of giving up that space in return for a place for the kids to lock their bikes and scooters. We had a we had a sizable quorum, 13 of us, and we approved at 13-0. Right. Are there any comments or questions on this? Hearing none, let's call a vote. We have a motion to approve the installation uh, of a NYC DOT bike corral at the northwest corner of 7th Street and 4th Avenue. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes. All right, let's move into community session. Uh, do I have the thing? All righty. So let's start with Dan. Dan. Campanelli. Yeah. Campanelli. Oh, Dan Wiley. Oh, right. You know what, Dan Wiley? Let's start with you. There's Dan, Dan Campanelli. Oh, right. But we'll go with Dan Wiley. He got up first. All right, well, I left, I mix it up. <laughs> I, I left some stuff uh, on the piano uh, from Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez following the tragic uh, crash uh, that took two children's lives. Uh, and also point out that we had, she had secured uh, funding for the Safe Routes to Schools program uh, back 
when there was an uh, earlier tragic incident at uh, 3rd Avenue and 9th Street where we lost two young boys uh, from a truck turning. And so while some improvements were done, we did obviously need to do much more. And uh, this funding, DOT still has federal funding to do these things. So I'm glad you passed that um, resolution on DOT. Um, also, I put a statement that Congressman Velasquez led along with Congressman Nadler and Maloney on the uh, East River helicopter crash, which is a tragic reminder of how tourist flights pose significant public safety risks and calling for a suspension uh, and ex until exhaustive review can be done uh, on the safety hazards of operating tourist helicopters in such a dense urban airspace. And in fact, uh, once again, reiterating the call to F FAA, the city, and municipalities in New Jersey to ban helicopter flights over uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn, which isn't a good fit uh, for the most densely populated city in the U.S. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, you guys for supporting the Congressman Superfund bill. Uh, I was working very hard at the end doing last minute edits to answer your 10 questions that the committee came up with. And as Sire uh, mentioned, we actually are making some improvements to the bill based on the feedback we got from the committee uh, to make sure that residents, homeowners, renters could also uh, get some of the benefits if they are displaced from a Superfund site. Uh, but if you want to read more about it, please take copies uh, of this very well-written response to your 10 questions. Um, but I also just wanted to mention uh, that the reason it isn't a grant program, uh, the Congresswoman has uh, in the past tried to convert the SBA disaster loan program into a grant program, but wasn't able to get it passed. So that is a goal that we would like to do, but under the current political climate, we couldn't real realistically get this passed. However, this Superfund bill does have the potential to get some Republican support, because it actually uh, pays for itself. Of course, you'd have to agree to tax oil and, uh, you know, chemical companies. Uh, so, <clears throat> but we're very glad to add Community Board 6. I also mentioned that Community Board 3 across the East River also last night uh, voted to support the bill in solidarity with the Superfund sites that are in your district. Um, and lastly, uh, I have um, uh, a press release, uh, Velasquez advances public housing measures. She got uh, two amendments in the House Financial Services Committee to help protect Section 8 tenants and also uh, to have better oversight on funding for public housing. So I have those uh, over there, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Because um, it's only fair, Dan. <laughs> of course. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Campanelli from Assemblymember Carroll's office. A couple quick updates. Folks, uh, um, obviously, given the uh, the tragic crash on Fifth Avenue, uh, the assembly member introduced two pieces of legislation so far uh, to deal with it. Um, one has to do, well, there's actually two that have to do with reporting. Uh, it was obviously reported that the driver had some kind of um, either seizure or physical something happened to her suddenly. Uh, at least that's what's been said, that caused her to uh, drive in the manner that she did. And so we introduced uh, two bills that deal with uh, physicians having to report uh, to the Department of Health and the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, if a, a patient is diagnosed with a, a chronic, sudden chronic ailment that causes, would cause them to suddenly lose consciousness. Um, and at that point, the, the DMV would have the power to uh, suspend the license um, until such time that a physician reviews it and says that the person's safe to drive. Uh, we have another piece of legislation that deals with the, because you know, the driver had, I think, eight violations over an eight or nine month period related to speed cameras. 
uh, whether through red lights or at, in school zones. So we introduced a bill in the process of introducing a bill that, that deals with suspending registrations um, because since they're photo violations, as uh, Brad said earlier, I think, um, you can't link it to the license at this time. It only goes to the registration. So a current bill that we have, uh, we have like, we have it set out over like a 24 month period. Um, the first would, we would start to suspend a, a license after six, we would do a warning after four, certified mail warning after four to say you're two violations away um, from having your license suspended and suspend the license after the sixth. Uh, and then we, we go up from there over a three year period. Uh, and we're working on some other efforts related to that. Um, there's going to be a lot of obviously conversation around this and the city's perspective. Um, so hopefully we can get some good le legislation to uh, keep reckless drivers off the roads. Um, additionally, the assembly member is not here tonight because he's in Albany. Obviously it's a budget time. So uh, the assembly just did their one house budget today. Um, the Senate released theirs as well. The response to the governor's executive budget. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the budget, about the Assembly's priorities, and some of the things that we think uh, we need to focus on, we're doing another budget town hall at PS321 on Thursday, March 22nd. Doors open 6.30, presentation at 7. Uh, there's some flyers that are over there. All are welcome. Thank you. Uh, Raul. With Emma on deck. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raul Rothblatt. I'm the Director of Community Affairs for State Senator Jesse Hamilton. I, before anything, I just want to acknowledge the six people who've died violent deaths in the last week or so, two in Park Slope and then four last night. Um, uh, there was a quadruple mur murder in Brownsville, and um, uh, all of this uh, we feel is preventable. All of this we can have better laws to prevent traffic violence and gun violence. This is a choice that we've made as a society. There are, there are things that we can do to prevent it. We're going to try all sorts of ways. I'm glad to go after Bobby because, um, or after Dan, because uh, Bobby Carroll uh, um, uh, contacted our office to uh, introduce these, this legislation. So we're doing two bills together, and we worked really fast to get this together. So it was, it was really... Um, uh, it was very exciting to, you know, have this great relationship and really important to address this very carefully. Uh, I have something about the bill numbers about that. Um, so if you want more information, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of details and things are all working out. We have other bills also related to this that I do want to mention. Some that I've mentioned before, including the uh, Every School Bill, um, which is to put speed cameras uh, near schools. This is, none of these things are uh, the silver bullet, so to speak. Um, we, we have to change the culture, the speeding cameras, the, these bills are all uh, a way to change the culture. I know, you know, given the, the tragedies, like I've been like, yo, I need to do full stops all the time if I'm on my bicycle, you know. So I, I, I think there's also a culture change that we would like to do. We are going to really be uh, talking about this a lot. Um, I also... Oh, um, you know, I brought um, one thing. It's actually kind of old news, but um, I, it's relevant now. Um, there was a bus crash in Queens, uh, and I brought this report. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a little bit related. There's, there are certain bus companies that are consistently higher dangerous drivers, and certain companies that just have horrible records, and some that are much better. So we actually collated some of this information and also introduced legislation about that. So I think... You know, we have, as we're focused on this one crash on 5th and, uh, and 9th, there are other related issues. So, I mean, this bus one, I, I was quite proud of uh, that we were able to do that. So I have a couple copies of this if you want it. Um, also, on the issues of traffic, you know, last week we were talking about the 5th uh, and 9th. The week before that, we had a meeting with PS172. And the reason I want to bring this up, uh, it's on 4th Avenue and 30th Street, 
it's right next to a, um, a gas station. But it made me think that we have lots of schools along 4th Avenue. Uh, and uh, there's lots of issues. And I think it might be time. It, it's cut between two community boards, different uh, city council dif districts, um, and uh, different state senate districts. But uh, it's, it's and every sort of district you can imagine, it's cut up. But uh, I think it might be time also to, to think about that whole strip and that all of the schools need to coordinate actions a little bit better on that. So um, if, if you have ideas on that, please let me know. Um, I have lots of things. My, uh, so I, we have on Friday, it's not uh, in the district, but we're going to be doing our uh, Shirley Chisholm Awards with Women of Excellence. Uh, we are going to be honoring Anita Scott from, uh, from uh, uh, District 15, School District 15. So if you want to show your support for her, uh, let me know about that. And also on Sunday in the district, we are doing a Scree event at the Park Slope Food Co-op, uh, 12, uh, 12 to 2.30 p.m. I have some flyers, um, and so let me know. I would be great. I know there's been good outreach for Scree, but there's also a lot of people who don't know about it. So I, I think always, uh, it's always good to push Scree and Tree. And oh. I, I could keep going on, but let me You're stop right all there. The time from your colleagues. So okay, my. Uh, we have 12 minutes before we have to get All right, so trip. thank you for your time. Thank, thanks, and I'll be uh, glad to stay in touch. Uh, Emma Rodney. <laughs> Ricky on tech. Good evening. My name is Emma Rooney. I'm here from the office of assistant oh, speaker, sorry. Felix. That's all right. <laughs> uh, Felix Ortiz. A couple of things. Uh, this week, the Assembly passed legislation that would enable NYCHA to use an alternative design build procurement process in order to streamline renovations and rehabilitations, including replacing uh, outdated boilers and heating systems, uh, an issue that the residents have been dealing with far too long already. Uh, the bill would also require that NYCHA practice greater transparency reg regarding policies and procedures relating to uh, lead based paint poisoning prevention. Uh, Cuomo also announced that he's working on plans to appoint uh, a NYCHA tenant leadership advisory task force. Uh, so today was the walkout. A uh, couple of things uh, based uh, legislation uh, that the assistant speaker has introduced to strengthen school-based mental health support systems. Uh, one piece of legislation that would requ require statewide in all schools, public and private, that there be at least one registered uh, so, uh, social worker in schools, and then also a piece of legislation that would introduce a statewide bullying hotline to help uh, prevent and counteract the negative effects of bullying in schools. Uh, yes, and then the march that happened, the NYC March for Safe Streets that happened on Monday following the crash that we've all been talking about and feeling depressed about. Uh, the assistant speaker has a piece of legislation in commission now that is uh, addressing texting and driving. Uh, so he's always been an advocate for safe driving and uh, non-distracted driving. Uh, also, he's been working with the DOT recently to ensure that uh, streets and corners near our schools are more safe for our kids getting to school. So have a good night. Thank you. Okay, I'll keep it very brief. I'm Ricky from Assemblymember Simon's office. Um, so the assembly member is up in Albany, as you've been hearing that everyone from the state offices are up in Albany. Um, she's had a really wonderful week, actually. Um, so she passed her ERPO bill, which is the extreme risk protection orders. It passed in the assembly, and we hope that it will be taken up swiftly in the Senate. Um, if you have any questions about that, please see me afterwards about that bill. Um, there, uh, a, the one house bill in the assembly was introduced today, um, and her firearms violence research Institute was included, which is great. However, with no funding attached. So that's something. Um, so we would really appreciate if you keep signing that petition. That would be fin fantastic. If you haven't already, it's on her website. Again, please find me afterwards. Um, also design bills was included in the one house 
budget as well, so that's great. Um, for the BQE, yeah, sorry. For the BQE, thank you, Glenn. Um, so that's also really great, and Glenn was part of a group that went up to Albany and um, lobbied about the design build for BQE, so great job, great effort. Um, also, dis her third annual Dyslexia Awareness Day is going to be on April 19th, which is a Thursday next month, um, and it's going to be up in Albany. Um, and there is a town hall tomorrow night on the Brooklyn House of Detention and closing Rikers. Um, that's going to be at the Belarusian Church at 401 Atlantic. It's co-sponsored with um, Senator Velman at Montgomery, um, Council Member Levin, um, and that starts at 6.30. Uh, you can give us a call if you have any questions about that as well, or you can call Council Member Levin's office. Um, and that is it for us. Feel free to find me afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Oscar. I told you. Quick, Oscar. Uh, just, just quickly, uh, I have here a letter the senator wrote to legislative leaders requesting more money for school-based health centers, which is for some of uh, lower-income families the only place their children can afford to get health care so uh, that requests four million plus dollars towards that and also tomorrow uh, at congregation Beth Elohim uh, senator will be giving uh, some comments about bail reform and how people not being able to afford bail while they're uh, while they're awaiting trial can really destroy their life and ways we can change that thank you uh, Daniela and Dustin, I know you signed up, so if you are fast, I would love to hear you because you've waited, and if you're still here. If you are not still here, then God bless you. <laughs> yeah, please, please yeah. do. Hi, I'm Daniela Acker. I work at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, where um, the driver accountability group was mentioned before. Um, we provide a lot of different services to people who come in contact with the, just, uh, the criminal justice system, but also the community in general. I put out some flyers. I work for the Victim Services Program there, um, and we have two free support groups coming up in the community, um, one for people working on emotional wellness and one for people healing from violence from um, abusive relationships. So if you're in the mental health profession or work in schools or anywhere like that, you can grab a few flyers, see me afterwards. They're free. We're giving out um, metro cards and meals. So thank you. You sure? Okay. Thank you. We just wanted to say thank you. Oh, thank you so we, much. We appreciate what you guys did for us. We didn't want to interrupt and sign in while the meeting was going on. But Community Board 6, thank you so much for supporting White Wolf Gardens Public Housing. Thanks so much. Of course. Thank you. Thanks for staying. Yeah, I need that. So moved. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? All right.